Okay, so let's just talk about some options. And because we wanted to leave most of this open for conversation, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. So let's just think about what Aristotle said. He said, learning to live a good life and to be happy requires effort, time, and dedication like any other prowess. So that means that basically what he says is that you just have to work at it. So the question is, is there a way that we can collect a data point knowing that people are working at becoming happy? So could it mean that, that if somebody buys a certain product, somebody drives a certain route to work, somebody goes on a certain holiday, somebody eats a certain food rather than the food that they don't want to eat or go to a holiday that they prefer than the one they don't go to, that they are in a better state of being happiness? Because the biggest crisis, one of the big crises with happiness is that it cannot be a continuous state of mind. Because the problem is, as soon as you're very happy, you feel that it wears off and you have to be unhappy to become happy again. So it creates a complex cycle. So that means that happiness has been and is today some context of skill that must be learned. If you think of the kind of really historical view of how people see this. So one of the big misconceptions, and this is from a researcher publishing this recently, saying that, that happiness is that the path to happiness involves avoiding pain. So we think that that, that if, you, if you remove pain, then you'll be fine. And that means that the pain is actually a necessary part of happiness. And that's the unfortunate side effect. So that means that could you measure and make your definition of happiness, that happiness is the absence of pain? And can you make the definition of pain, that pain is defined as the absence of happiness? And if you think about what pain is, is there a way that you can turn it into a data point or into something that becomes measurable that you can actually use in some way that is useful to you in your business or whatever you want to achieve? Now, Marx and Durkheim have argued that in modern societies have designed themselves around the fabrication to try to deal with how we make people happy. And if you, if you think about novelty as one of the fundamental drivers of happiness, is that you fabricate new wishes and needs. So that means that that instead of asking somebody a question about what they're going to like next, what you do is you, you kind of create something for them. You put them in a situation where that once you've educated them on this new idea, that they will love it more than the idea that was there before. And if you do that, and they, and they feel that they do not have access to that new idea, they will feel unhappy. And that means that in the pursuit of happiness, people will then go and find whatever that product is, that service, whatever it is that now is seemingly accessible, they will want access to it. And once they have access to it, they will be happy temporarily. <laughs> so it's like an ongoing cycle. And if you think of a lot of modern economic systems are almost built on the back of this for this phenomenon. So that means that while we try to encourage individualistic lifestyle and we think that this is how people become happy, the focus really has been so far on, on consumerism. And that means that you buying stuff. And that means that if you don't buy stuff, you are not happy. So the question is, why is that the case? And we found that the reason why it's so prominent is because there are just so many different ways in which you can now use your existing data points and your existing ways in which you know that you are economically engaging with your customers and turn those into meaningful data sets. The problem is most people still think that you need to run a survey and the survey is going to tell you exactly and I bet you that if you had to go look at the actual data points around how people behave against what they say they feel, there are massive mismatches between those two. So Yuval's got a great way of looking at it. He said the basic reaction of the human mind to pleasure and to achievement is not satisfaction, it's the craving for more. Because once you know that you have access, once you know that you can achieve and do something, you immediately feel that you need to get more. And the problem is, what does enough mean? At what point do you know that you have enough? Because once you have too much, you will be unhappy with the fact that this is now available in abundance. So that means that anything that's in scarcity makes you unhappy. And once you have a little bit of it, you are happy. And once you take it away, then you're unhappy again. So there's this ongoing cycle of how we see people drive towards this craving of engagement. So... For those who are interested in TED Talks, you know that there's a whole conversation around how do you find happiness and how do you create it? And the biggest part of it is that some people are saying you can't. It's something you should be told to be happy. You should be, you should be involved in, in communities that will drag you into their world and they will make you happy. Because if you are inherently in a pessimistic society and a pessimistic community and a community that is hateful all the time, you will fall in the trap of that community. So that's why we start thinking that it's a social science problem 
in some cases more so than a psychological problem or even an anthropological problem. The other thing is that if you look at studies that have been done on the history of happiness, and if you look at Robert Waldinger, I'm not sure if anybody has followed his studies, they did a basically a study of 80 years with males and, and, and how they changed through their lives. And, and if you think about it, only one major phenomena emerged as the thing that made people truly happy, and that is their social connections. It's the way in which they connect themselves and the way they find their fit within a community. So the question is, what is that community? Is that community a family? Is it a team? Is it a company? Is it a sports team? Is it a club that you belong to? Is it the people that you travel with as travel buddies? What is that community? And then how does that affect your mindset? So that means that we now know that in the context of the social studies, that this has become a very prominent prominent topic to think about.